the focus of all cities are listening meetings is the pack for the future the process opened by uclg to renew our social contract for the people for the planet and for governments i invite emilia size the secretary general of uclg to take the floor for the opening remarks emilia Thank you very much, uh, Jordi, the coordinator of the UCLG Committee on Culture and, and one strong uh, municipal activist, I would say. Um, and the time is indeed now, colleagues. Um, culture does not only shape the way that we dream and it doesn't only shape our feelings, the way that we mourn, the way that we celebrate, the way that we eat. It also helps us to uh, deal with those feelings. What would have happened if we wouldn't have had books and music and series, if we wouldn't have been able to visit museums from our homes during these difficult times of the, of the pandemic? What would have happened in the world if we wouldn't have been able to actually deal with each other with our conflicts and with our needs and expectations with the help of culture? It's, it's hard to imagine. And yet, we are not putting culture in the right space in the political dialogue, in development. We are uh, often linking culture only with entertainment. And then it suddenly, it, it, it does not become a priority. Uh, we also don't see it as a trigger, not only of our past and our heritage, but a very a strong factor for shaping our future and how future generations are going to be finding their space in this world that we all share. And during this time, as we work towards the, the pact for the future that Jordi was just describing, our new renewed social contracts with the lessons that we have learned from this pandemic, but also from other crises affecting our world, we, we have um, learned and we are convinced that there are strong avenues also that link culture with the challenges that uh, humanity is facing. And this is why we are very happy that um, uh, we, uh, we, we have with us so many different partners that have also these views, these perspectives that are conscious that surviving is not enough for our species, that we need more from our being, from the world that we live in. And we want to celebrate with you some accomplishments that we have. I think it is extremely critical that we have been able to develop a Rome charter around uh, uh, cultural rights with the participation of all of you. It is also very critical that the G20 governments have included culture as a very important component of, um, of their discussions. And we want to celebrate us coming together in the campaign Culture 2030 goal, because it, it shows the maturity of our organizations and of the narrative that we are and now, while celebrating those achievements, we also invite you to look at the future and see how we can make sure that we integrate culture in development policies in a different manner, in progress in general, in, in our futures. And in order to do that, we think we have a very critical instrument, which is our culture summit. And we are delighted to have with us today the host of the summit, Mayor Sawyer, the mayor of Izmir, who is going to present to us what culture means for his city, for him, and for our culture summit. Mayor Sawyer, the floor is yours. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you to give me this opportunity. We are so happy that Izmir is going to host the UCLG Culture Summit in September. My hometown is one of the largest port cities in the Mediterranean with four and a half million inhabitants. It has 8,500 years of history. For centuries, the goods coming from Asia through the Silk Road have been sent to European and North African countries from Izmir. People brought their arts, their culture, along with their goods. The city has become the point where Eastern and Western cultures mingle and live together in harmony. Diversity and coexistence 
is the, at the core of Izmir's identity. In Culture Summit, we will work together to connect culture and urban resilience. We will exchange on fostering cultural policies on heritage, creativity, diversity, and knowledge, which are key for local sustainable development. We will promote culture as the fourth pillar of development and a core component of global solidarity. I can say that in Izmir, we will meet, share, dialogue, and create together the future we want. In this respect, we will work in line with the Rome Charter and promote the right to participate in cultural life as a condition for a better society. We will invest together in cultural policies at the summit. We will provide our societies with the tools for dialogue, coexistence, and freedom. This exchange requires, of course, your experiences and expertise, also the active participation of your communities. We will debate on open governance of culture at local, national, and international levels. Through exchanging on cultural policies, we will imagine the future together. We will promote human creativity, human experience, progress, and innovation. We invite all actors related to culture to contribute to the UCLG Summit in Izmir. In this way, we will work to make cities more active in national and local levels to implement the Agenda 2030. Therefore, we invite local authorities, cultural institutions, practitioners, experts, scholars to Izmir Summit. We will strengthen our response to our common challenges. The COVID-19, along with the global warming and losses of biodiversity, threaten sustainable development. These are challenges without borders. International solidarity and sustainable urbanization is an indispensable global field of action in facing these mega challenges and crises. The summit will also be an excellent opportunity for cities across the world to connect with the local culture of Izmir. The city has accumulated arts and culture for 8,500 years. I invite you all to the summit digital launch of the summit on the 10th of June and to the physical meetings starting from 9th of September in Izmir. Thanks a lot for your attention and patience. Thank you very much, Mayor Sawyer, thank and, and thank you to the people of Izmir for uh, welcoming this initiative. We really look forward to joining you there and to making the link between the past and the future, which is so tangible um, in, in the city of, of Izmir. We really think it's going to be an inspiration for many, many, many around the world. Thank you very much. Thank you so, so now, much. Allow me to, uh, allow me to go to uh, Luca Trifone. Luca Trifone is the Director of International Relations uh, of Rome. Uh, Rome, as you know, has a very special place in the hearts of most people around the world, but in particular of the hearts of the UCLG Committee on Culture, because it has been a driver of many of our, of our key instruments. Uh, they have been developed with the inspiration of Rome. But Luca is also here because he is working with us as SERPA, a special advisor of the mayor of Rome in the process of Urban, Urban 20. You are wearing many hats, Luca. Thank you for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you, Emilia. Probably too many hats, but OK, I will try to, to, to live up to the task. And dear colleagues, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Let me first thank uh, the conveners of today's event and all of you for this wonderful opportunity to illustrate the meaning of culture in the regeneration of the city and in the recovery from COVID and the importance attained to this issue in Italian chairmanship of U20. 
I would like to start quoting the statement of the Global Task Force convened by UCLG in September uh, 2019 Sustainable Development Goal Summit. We commit to promote culture as the fourth pillar of development and as a core component of local identity and its role as a strand of global solidarity and as a vector for peace and human rights. We further commit to foster locally relevant cultural policies and programs of memory, heritage, creativity, diversity and knowledge, which are key for local sustainable development. And this is actually the perspective we have to endorse, that culture is a key element to sustainable development in human dignity. And this is what cities actually do the 2020 Rome Charter, promoted by UCLG and Roma Capitale, is a clear demonstration of this consideration of this attitude. The document espouses the principle of culture as a pillar of identity, includes the most compelling narrative on cultural rights, and consider the impact of COVID-19 in cultural life of cities and communities, provides frames and options for future cultural policies. Rome Charter is a real pact for the future, whose guiding idea is that the post-pandemic models of society need to have cultural rights as one of the core components. The messages of the Charter served as an inspiration for many cities around the world. The, the pure consideration that culture is an essential part of city life is also shared by the joint Italian chairmanship of Urban 20 this year and the, the chairmanship it is currently hold, held by the cities of Rome and Milan. The Italian press is strengthening the links between environmental sustainability and culture, since climate change represents one of the greatest threats that culture is facing, in terms especially of preservation of cultural heritage. More, the prolonged lockdown period showed all the people worldwide the need of culture. But cities and communities have to get back to their life. Culture entails sense of belonging in communities, creates new forms of participation, preserves the old forms of participation, makes all of us as one, recognizing what brings us together. Culture is one of the main factors to get back to normal life and to overcome the psychological pressure COVID is currently posing us. In the final communique of U20, cities will stress the importance of cultural life, acknowledging that culture has been catastrophically impacted by the pandemic, but it will also play a key role in the social and economic recovery in our, of our cities. In this respect, Italian U20 presence is having a very close contact with the G20 track of Ministries of Culture in order to exchange best practices and to find mutual and shared solutions to the challenges of environmental sustainability, preservation of cultural heritage and strengthening the role of culture in everyday life of the cities. Together with the track of Ministries of Culture, we, we would like to convene those messages, those messages to the G20 ministries of culture and to the heads of state and government. Uh, we want to cultivate the message that creativity and resilience must adapt to the new and unknown and are the best tools for us to, to get adapted. At the same time, building efficient and sustainable infrastructure, preserving existing cultural realities. We are perfectly aware that the task is not easy, but we are absolutely focused on it, Italian presidency, the city's member of U20 and the conveners. And we are sure that the Italian presidency of U20 will be a milestone in this respect. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Luca Trifone, for these uh, for these words and also for the work uh, that you are doing with us within the framework of uh, of the G20 and and the Urban 20, which is the instrument of cities uh, before uh, the G20. And thank you for this continued support of the city of Rome to the work that we do.
Culture is an antidote for the effects of the crisis. This is the wording that we have inserted in our uh, decalogue for the, for the COVID era. But it is also uh, a visioning tool. It is indeed um, a very critical tool and a skill for the children, for the girls and boys of the future. And as such, we need to treat it. We will need more investment. We will need more guaranteed access. We need culture to have a different space in the, in the political um, discussion. I am, with these remarks, going to give the floor now to um, my colleague, uh, Octavi de la Varga, the Secretary General of uh, Metropolis for organizing these um, cities are listening experiences. And we are going to be actually listening and, and, and sharing the experience from partners. How do uh, networks uh, that work around culture experience uh, this, uh, this pandemic? How is culture being shaped during this pandemic? What does it mean? Uh, a very interesting topic. I, I am in your hands uh, now, Octavi, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Emilia. Good afternoon to everybody from, from Barcelona. And first of all, thank you that I, today, well, as Emilia said, we, we support and co-organize these uh, cities of listening, but I'm happy as well to be here today moderating this, this stand of the session because I hope that this also, I have a, a second objective today, apart from the objectives of this session, that moderating this session, it will help to trigger the cultural debate within the metropolitan debate, which is something that we are still missing in Metropolis. Said that, uh, maybe all for some of the UCLG members, the whole UCLG family members, uh, some of the networks that we'll be talking right now in this strand of, of the session of today, they, they, are, they are not aware about what they are doing, and maybe they are not really even aware, apart from the Culture Commission, that they have been working with UCLG for all, all over eight years on different areas, on trying to put culture on the agenda, on the global agendas, and on the local agendas. I just want to say that everything, this relationship started uh, on the global campaign entitled Culture 2015 Goal, and that is a bulb when the, the Agenda 2030 was uh, launched. It was transformed in the Culture 2030 Goal, and as well last April or last year, during the pandemic, the partners, all these partners that today are talking here, joined it as well, UC, UCLG, as well, on a statement called Culture and the COVID-19 Pandemic, which is something that now we are going to discuss, as, which is a the, the role of culture, which is the role that culture has been playing in the pandemic, as well the solutions that can, can culture can put on the table in, in our societies, in the dynamics of, 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 of during the pandemic, at the aftermath of the pandemic. I, I just want only to, to highlight the, the, the preamble of, the, of this statement that emphasizes something, and I think it's interesting to remind all the participants about that. The, it says this, this statement, that this, the statement is called Ensure Culture Fulfills Its Potential in Responding to the COVID-19 Pandemic. And it says, with the world faced with the COVID-19 pandemic today and the need to rebuild our societies tomorrow, culture should be at the heart of the response. Culture brings inspiration, comfort, and hope into people's life. To harness this potential, the Culture 2030 Goals movement in the context of its engagement with the United Nations 2030 Agenda calls UN agencies, governments, and all other stakeholders to act. With this in mind, I now give the floor to, to the different representative of the, of the cultural networks. Uh, I'm afraid I've been told I have to be very, very strict with the time. You have five minutes each. So excuse me in advance if I'm, I'm forced to interrupt you at some point. So let's start it with Nupur Prothi, board member of the ICOMOS, the International Council of Monuments and Sites. So uh, happy to, to listen to you and your views on that. Thank you very much for inviting me. This is one of the meetings where I'm hearing culture so often right at the beginning of the meeting. So I feel I'm part of my family already. Uh, so why is the perspective of culture important to the future of our cities, the future of our people and the future of our children? I think ICOMOS, the network I represent, uh, the International Council on Monuments and Sites, will tell you um, that this is the decade of action. So an approach for the future that builds upon our past acknowledges that each society, nation, culture, and people carry within them the power and knowledge to change the course of the events taking place today, which is exactly the mission of this group sitting here. 
We know culture is the fourth pillar of sustainable development, but it is no longer a group of people or a handful of us dedicated professionals or effective governments that are planning for people. Culture is actually providing a key in the hand of each and every citizen to scale up our intentions, to reach a common goal at the end of the decade. This gives hope that we can decode together the problems of today, including the pandemic. We can decode them together without boundaries between us, but together bringing in our individual, social, personal perspectives to find solutions for the problems that plague our cities. The way to scale up our intentions, each organization, each individual, each effort, to scale up our intentions so that we can operate successfully in Rabat and Rome, Izmir and Lisbon, Bilbao and Bangalore, Santiago and Stockholm, is to recognize that each culture and its people have a deep memory of living with nature, solving problems of landscapes, working towards food sustainability, preparing and coping with climate events. As part of the International Council on Monuments and Sites, ICOMOS, a deeper understanding of culture for a better tomorrow is our focus as an organization. With over 10,000 members from 101 countries, nearly 270 institutional members, over 100 national committees, we operate in the field of cultural and natural heritage, taking this message of the importance, the pivot of culture into society, into the countries we operate in, our cities and our projects, reiterating that cultural context, perspective and understanding will help put in place long lasting, sustainable solutions to every challenge that is thrown up by urbanization. Our backbone as an organization is our 28 scientific committees, each composed of a close knit, almost like a family of experts committed to the different needs such as cultural roots, another on cultural tourism, dedicated to historic towns and cities and villages, uh, cultural landscapes. We have one scientific committee on energy and sustainability, on economics of conservation, on risk preparedness, on shared built heritage. And besides these scientific committees, we have very, very active groups working on climate action and sustainability with my colleague Ege representing here, uh, having a very strong base today with emerging professionals who are taking our message forward. So culture is the key respected dignitaries and dear colleagues. We are all on the same side of this battle, preparing ourselves for a balanced world. As we cross the threshold, let's remember to carry our heritage as a crown with pride and an understanding that it will show us the way forward. All intentions and innovations will begin with our cultural capabilities. As professionals and governments, we are all committed to make this alliance make a difference on ground. The cities are listening, so are the people, and nature is watching this decade unfold. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for your crystal clear words. I've just noted down something that like it, understanding, understanding culture for a better future tomorrow. So thank you. And I think this is one of the keys of the debates of today. Now we're moving to Bit Sanshi, president of IFCCD, the International Federation of Coalitions for Cultural Diversity. Over to you. Thank you, Octavi. Uh, my name is not Beat. <laughs> uh, my name is Beat because I'm a guitarist and not a drummer. Apologies. But uh, that's okay. Uh, I'm, so you know now already that I'm a musician and I'm also General Secretary of the Swiss Musicians Union from Switzerland. The International Federation of Coalitions for Cultural Diversity is the voice of cultural professionals around the world. It brings together some 30 national coalitions from all five continents representing creators, artists, independent producers, distributors, broadcasters, and publishers in the book, film, television, music, live performance, and visual arts sectors. The IFCCD was created as a result of a major mobilization of civil society in favor of the adoption, ratification, and implementation of the UNESCO Convention on the Protection and Promotion of the Diversity of Cultural Expressions. In preparing today's contribution, 
I sadly realized how little has changed in our assessment of the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on culture since my respective intervention at the launch of the Statement by the Culture 2030 Goal campaign, almost one year ago. The current crisis has had and is still having devastating effects on the cultural life of most countries, both developed and developing. At the same time, many people seem to realize much more than before how important culture is for their daily life and well being now that they have limited access to it. The crisis also puts the vulnerability of the cultural sector into the spotlight. Artists, creators and cultural workers were among the first to suffer from economic distress because they were no longer allowed to create and perform as they used to. And they will be among the last to be able to return to normal working conditions. In many countries, the cultural sector is an informal one. Even before the pandemic, professional artists often barely made a decent living. And the lack of social protection is omnipresent. Current surveys in several European countries show that up to 40% of the freelancers in the cultural sector are considering changing their profession and are looking for jobs in other sectors. It may take many years to compensate for such an enormous strain brain of the creative sector and such a tremendous loss of cultural diversity. For truly sustainable development in and through culture, it could be extremely beneficial to globally invest in status of the artist legislation as promoted by UNESCO since more than 40 years. In some countries, Governments have announced enormous packages to save the economy, but not always do they include or find the right measures for the needs of the creative industries, and even less for the artists and performers who are often self-employed freelancers. That's why it is extremely important to engage and involve civil society in the design of support measures for the cultural sector and generally in the design of any cultural policies and cooperation projects, as artists and cultural practitioners themselves have the best knowledge of their own needs. This equally applies to local governments. Through many studies all over the world, we now know that culture has a very important economic role. In many regions, the creative sector has a higher economic weight than most other sectors. In other words, whether we acknowledge it or not, economically, culture already is at the core of sustainable development in these regions. So why shouldn't it be the same everywhere else? And culture is so much more than an economic factor. Culture is the creative reflection of the environment. It is the essential tool for people to cope with the challenges of the world we live in. Or even better, to quote the Rome Charter, culture is everything we do beyond survival. Culture is everything we do to enrich our lives. It is also the story that shapes our actions even when we are unaware of it. Culture describes the world and we see the world through its lens. This is needed more than ever in the current situation, where zillions of people have and see only poor perspectives for their lives, for their future. Indeed, at least in my understanding, culture has always been the main driver of human civilization. Therefore, it must be at the core of sustainable development. There is no way around it if we want to succeed. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. As you said, so much more than an economic factor, culture is as well all that we do beyond survival. So, and we should keep that in mind. Now, and before, apologies to all the panelists, if I mispronounce your, your names, but, but I'll try. Victoria Okoji, Okoji she's uh, from the Nigerian Libra Library Association, and she's board member of the IFLA, the International Federation 
of library associations and institutions. Over to you, please. Thank you very much and good day to everyone. And uh, thank you to the UCLG team for the invitation to the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, IFLA, to contribute here today. I know that we at IFLA are excited by the work proposed on the Pact for the Future, and in particular, the fact that it is being led by UCLG as the global organization for local and regional governments. There is a lot of talk of cooperation between stakeholders, but it is so often only really at the city, the town, the village level, under the guidance of lo great local governments that this becomes a reality. I can say clearly that IFLA is more than willing to contribute not only at the global level, but also by finding new ways to realize the potential of broad cooperation on the ground. Indeed, this cooperation with a wide range of actors come naturally to libraries. This is because libraries are institutions that resist categorization into any one area of policy and into any one SDG. Like other cultural actors and institutions, libraries cannot and should not be seen as only delivering progress against any one particular policy goal, which can too easily be deprioritized. Rather, they need to be seen as an enabler of inclusion of the fulfillment of potential and of the success of societies across the board. Libraries need to be seen as platforms, partners and portals to further opportunities, working with others inside and outside of local and regional government to support success across the SDGs providing a unique channel for you as policy makers to read the widest possible range of the population and across the range of action of local and regional government as over half of the voluntary local reviews already submitted have indeed recognized. The Rome Charter, I believe, provides a great starting point through its recognition of the importance of capabilities to discover, share, create, enjoy, and protect. Capabilities that everyone should have for culture to realize its potential as a pillar of sustainable development. These capabilities and their equitable provision are also at the heart of the mission of libraries as in so many cases, the most readily available cultural infrastructure available to po populations. Because just as the possibility we have to meet here today depends on an infrastructure made up of cables and masts, the possibility for people to develop the capabilities set out in the Rome Charter depends on a healthy infrastructure of cultural institutions and actors. As was underlined in the culture COVID-19 statement provided, promoted last year by the Culture 2030 Goal Campaign, it is only by ensuring that the cultural sector survives the pandemic and its aftermath intact that it will be able to make a full contribution to a new, more inclusive model of development tomorrow. This is not to say that there is no need to innovate, to strive always to be more inclusive, more effective, and more imaginative. But this is a task best done together by integrating libraries and all the cultural actors into the policy design process from the beginning. I hope therefore that the Pact for the Future provides an opportunity to work together 
to innovate together in order to be inspired by the good practice that already exists and to deliver on the Rome Charter and so the SDGs everywhere. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. As you said, ensuring the survival of the sector after the pandemic is a way of ensuring a sustainable and more inclusive society. And now it's over to Sylvia Fisher, Secretary General of IMC, the International Music Council. Over to you, please. Thank you very much for having me at this conversation today. Uh, thank you, Octavi. Thank you, UCLG. Uh, the International Music Council promotes access to music for all and the value of music in the lives of all people. Our work is based on uh, three pillars, which you can discover on the next slide. Uh, we are the world's largest network of music organizations mm -hmm. and institutions encompassing some 1000 organizations mm -hmm. that reach some 600 million persons eager to develop and to share knowledge and experience. Next slide, please. The IMC network represents also an unparalleled body of knowledge. Next slide. And expertise touching upon a great diversity of aspects of the musical ecosystem. I would like to have now with you a, a look at the core values of the International Music Council, uh, which are embedded in the five music rights. Next slide. And to see how they hold up in the crisis and the response to it. Regarding the first slide, uh, the first right, we are really alerted and concerned by reports from colleagues all over the world pointing to the COVID-19 crisis exacerbating the situation as global nationalist populism continues to restrict expressions and emergency procedures are enacted, which sometimes serve as mobile to silence dissident voices. With regard to the second right, the crisis affected those who teach and those who learn at equal levels. As with anything that relates to the digital realm, as everybody needs to go online, issues such as digital literacy, access to hardware and software, broadband availability, etc., impacted teachers and learners' capacity to cope with the challenge. In many countries, when schools started to open again, music lessons were among the ones uh, cut out immediately out of the school programs, because making music out of a sudden was branded with a stigma. Regarding the third slide about participation, the worldwide lockdown has driven our social interactions and our consumption and enjoyment of music almost entirely into the digital space. Streaming of and access to creative content has become indispensable in dealing with the adverse conditions of lockdown imposed on many of us. However, this needs to be seen against a backdrop that approximately 46% of the world population do not have access to an internet connection. We can't close our eyes to the fact that the digital divide risks aggravating pre-existing inequalities in access to music and the diversity of musical expressions. The global crisis has also put many intangible cultural heritage practices on hold with important consequences for the social and cultural life of communities. Concerning the fourth right, the most widespread measure other than financial aid, direct aid, uh, taken by governments has been the creation of fee-based platforms for streaming artistic content. At the same time, many musicians throughout the world have deliberately chosen to offer free access to their creative output. However, this does not offer them any revenue and such diversions from intellectual property right legislation need to be limited because art is work and needs to be remunerated, which brings me to the fifth right. Relying most on physical venues and shared experiences for their revenues, many musicians and, and music professionals have been heavily impacted by public health measures that led to a complete stop of their activities and income flows. Uh, 
The pandemic has also had a direct impact on the capacity of the music sector to create and distribute beyond the digital environment. The crisis has revealed gaps in the social and economic protection of musicians and music professionals who are often freelancers with multiple explorers. And my colleague from the IFCCD, Beat, uh, hinted to that. There is a widespread fear among music professionals that the longer their recovery is re delayed, the more lastingly these activities will be affected. Next slide. Yes. The COVID-19 pandemic has strongly disrupted the cultural sector, exacerbating its already existing vulnerability and brought to light the close linkages among all dimensions of society. At the same time, the pandemic has also shown the vital necessity of culture for people and communities. In the face of pandemic and other current global challenges, the transformative role of culture needs to be reflected in public policies. We thank you for your support as we call pub for public policy policies that support cultural communities, sectors, actors, and agents where they are facing negative impacts from the pandemic in order to ensure that they can survive the crisis and are able to play their part in the recovery tomorrow. We thank you for your support as we call for long-term integration of culture across government action at all levels, everywhere both as an end in itself and as an enabling factor in successful sustainable development, leaving no one and no place behind. Culture needs to be recognized as the fourth pillar of development, since human development is not sustainable without fundamental rights and freedoms and without respect for cultural diversity, since there is no social development without social justice, and since economic development is unsustainable if it exacerbates inequality and depletes natural resources. These beliefs drive our strong involvement in the Culture 2030 Goal Campaign and also in the Culture 2015 Goal Campaign since our involvement in 2013. And I thank you, and I thank you, CLG, and I thank also our colleagues, notably from Agenda 21 for Culture, uh, for their support in this. Thank you. And thank you for listening really listening thanks thank you very much and i i i may share maybe what all the audience the, this idea of the five rights of music i think should be applied to all arts i mean they can be applied to all areas of art and the issue that you have lighted, highlighted uh, the issue of access we live in a digital world this transition to a digital world but what about the access so that's something critical we need to needs further discussion now uh, it's over to to pierre clavet Mariala, president of Arterial Network. Over to you, Pierre. Uh, merci beaucoup. Uh, évidemment, je suis Pierre Clavier Mariala, uh, Arterial Network et membre de la campagne Culture 2030. Arterial est un réseau euh, panafricain de la société civile composé euh, d'artistes, d'acteurs culturels, d'entrepreneurs culturels, euh, qui est dirigé par un comité de pilotage euh, composé de cinq membres et qui représente les cinq régions de l'Afrique. Euh, les quelques axes d'intervention d'Arterial sont le plaidoyer, le renforcement de capacité, l'accès au marché, la gestion des connaissances et, et la diffusion de l'information. Nous abordons donc ce sujet avec une petite vision, en fait, le constat en Afrique, la zone évidemment opérationnelle de notre réseau. En Afrique, la situation du secteur culturel est très précaire et sous-animée. Des gens avant la pandémie, peu d'États arrivaient à reconnaître la place de la culture et donc de donner à ce secteur la place qu'il faut dans le processus de développement. C'est bien à tort que les gouvernements n'offrent pas de cadre d'expression culturelle, car la vérité est bien juste, selon que plus la culture serait prise en compte, mieux la place de chaque citoyen serait réelle dans la construction d'une société inclusive et apaisée. La pandémie continue de faire de ravages, évidemment, pour le secteur culturel dans l'Afrique. Avec l'arrêt brusque des activités, le secteur de la culture, les acteurs culturels ont fait preuve de résilience. Malgré les confinements et les manques d'espace d'exercice, 
comme pour dire que la culture se vit partout et nous identifie. Donc, des nouvelles formes et modes d'expression culturelle ont pris forme. La culture s'exprime en nous, partout où nous sommes, car c'est un besoin. C'est une nécessité. Il n'y a pas de vie sans culture. Aujourd'hui, la tendance qui est pour nous une très bonne chose par rapport à notre vision, par rapport à notre mission, par rapport à tout le plaidoyer qu'on fait. La tendance en Afrique est que les visions classiques des États en Afrique, où les politiques centrales euh, décident de tout, jusqu'au moindre détail, n'a pas fait du bien au secteur culturel. Aujourd'hui, une nouvelle tendance, euh, confirmée évidemment par la pandémie, est visible pour la culture. C'est ce besoin de rapprocher la culture des populations de faire exprimer la culture au sein de tous les espaces d'organisation humaine, famille, village, quartier, communauté, région. Il faut vivre la culture puisqu'elle place l'homme au cœur de tout développement. Cette tendance qui consiste à faire démarrer l'aménagement du cadre d'expression culturelle par la base est en train d'installer la culture dans l'expression de la vie de tous les jours. Au niveau d'artérial, L'expérience du programme Ville Créative Africaine a prouvé à travers le modèle de Ségou au Mali qu'une vie culturelle permettant à la communauté de promouvoir les valeurs du dialogue interculturel, de cohésion sociale, du vivre ensemble, d'expression de la diversité culturelle, conduit à ce que les citoyens se sentent impliqués dans la gestion de la communauté. Donc, donner la place à la culture, c'est permettre à l'ensemble des populations de se sentir prises en compte, de se sentir concernées dans l'effort de construction d'une société apaisée. L'expérience de Ségou, évidemment, est en train d'être dupliquée par quelques autres villes de l'Afrique, avec à la clé, évidemment, une politique culturelle pour chacune d'elles. Donc, la volonté politique en Afrique essaie de se mettre en place progressivement, car on a constaté, même au niveau des politiques d'intégration sous-régionale et régionale, la dimension culturelle est en train de se prendre forme au sein des sphères politiques. Dans certaines sous-régions africaines, des hauts cadres sont responsables pour s'occuper des questions de la culture, et le volet culture devient un département spécifique d'importance avérée. Les acteurs culturels sont de plus en plus associés sur des questions de développement culturel. Même dans les politiques de coopération internationale, des programmes sont actuellement en place pour mieux structurer le secteur afin d'en faire des industries, des industries culturelles des vrais leviers de développement. Et à ce niveau-là aussi, les précautions sont prises afin d'aborder les choses sur toutes les dimensions, donc dimension locale, dimension nationale, dimension régionale, sous-régionale, internationale. Une façon de dire que rien ne se fera ou ne se décidera pour demain sans la culture. Pour terminer, nous dirons que si aujourd'hui le monde est unanime, tous les dispositifs le les reconnaissent au niveau des localités, des États, des sous-régions, des régions, des institutions de coopération, des Nations unies, que la culture, est un, et, et la culture et ses acteurs doivent jouer pleinement leur rôle pour repenser, instaurer le monde durable de demain, il faut que chacun prenne sa part d'engagement et énonce les signaux de mise en œuvre, car la pandémie a renforcé la véracité de fait et nous a mis en face de la juste réalité. La citoyenneté responsable de demain passera par la culture. Je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup, Pierre. J'entends de, de toutes les présentations, vous, vous tous, vous êtes d'accord cette idée de la, la culture euh, est un élément critique pour le, le lendemain de, de la pandémie, le développement de nos sociétés. Et aussi, je voudrais remarquer vos paroles quand vous avez dit il faut rapprocher encore la culture aux populations, placer la culture à la base de la vie quotidienne et avec les citoyens. Et je pense que la commission culture de CGVU, le travail de CGVU, eh, va dans cette ligne aussi, lier les gouvernements locaux d'impulser les travaux de vos norco, oui. de rapprocher la culture pour faire des, des villes et des citoyens plus libres et plus démocratiques. Et on va finir euh, avec euh, with Tere Badia. She is the Secretary General of Culture Action Europe. So it's over to you, Tere. Thank you very much, Octavi. <clears throat> good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to all. And first of all, of course, I would thank uh, UCLG for inviting me and thanks the cities who are listening to, to, to be there. So I'm representing Culture Action Europe, uh, which is uh, the major European network of cultural networks, organizations, artists, activists, academics, and policymakers. 
And we are also a cross-sectorial network uh, that is representing all sorts of cultural practices, uh, from performing arts to literature, from visual arts to music, museums, from art universities uh, to community centers, but also those cultural practices working in dialogue with science, technology and society. Uh, the main mission of Culture Action Europe is to put culture at the very heart of public debate and advocate for arts and cultures as a fundamental building block of the collective future of all of us. Uh, our more than 160 members makes us also a privileged aggregator of knowledge about the European cultural ecosystem and therefore uh, we are one of the main port of call when the decision makers wants to reach the cultural and creative sectors. Of course, we have been following closely the impact of the pandemic in the cultural context in Europe. Uh, numerous conversations with our members and other stakeholders, numerous research have been very, very explicit about the extreme situation of cultural operators at all levels and in all its diversity, from the organizations to institutions, from the individuals and, and artists and cultural producers for festivals, museums, everyone is affected. So the numbers can vary in diverse countries, but, but as an example, I could give you the case of France where the health crisis is affecting more than 2,000 cinemas, 3,000 bookshops, 1,200 museums, 1,000 theaters, hundreds of galleries, uh, art galleries, and live events, including festivals. So this we can scale this, the, this, uh, these numbers up and down, but uh, this situation it's uh, repeated in all the world. The pandemic effects are not only look uh, are not to uh, are to see not only looking uh, at the economical or employment impact where the pandemic has already made uh, more more visible the structural precariousness of the majority of the people working in the cultural sector. Beyond the numbers, we can also see uh, examples where the whole cultural diversity is at, at stake, not only in the very existence of the diverse practices, but also in the threat that is to lose uh, the exercise of fundamental rights like freedom of cultural expression or other. Right. So we don't know how many of these cultural agents will be resilient enough to survive once the pandemic recedes. So I call all the governments to act decisively because the effects will be really devastating. Many other sectors, of course, have been deeply affected by the consequence of the pandemic, but culture has also confronts an, another structural lack, which is the lack of awareness by many policy makers and decision makers working in other policy fields about what culture is about. And I think this is in this fora where we think we need to be and we need to open dialogues. Because it has been said by many, many times and by many colleagues here uh, and beyond any sectorial approach, culture, cultures and cultural practices means much more. Uh, it has effects in societal and economic and environmental challenges. It is relevant in the diagnosis and formulation of the ecosocial challenges. And it has an enormous transformative capacity because it builds our critical perspective based in new knowledge and shared traditions and defines our way to understand the world. Culture, as I was said, acts on people, acts on communities and social movements, but also acts in political and economic spheres. And without the cultural dimension embedded in all ranges of public policies, there are no possibilities to construct common spaces, to secure diversity, to educate inequality and social justice, and to improve life and well being as a whole, considering our interdependence also with the territories we all inhabit. Therefore, the inclusion of a cultural dimension at the center of the debate of all public policies should not be an option, but a fundamental need and an urgency. Right now, we need a holistic strategy for inclusive, fair and sustainable development, and this must have a strong cultural dimension. This is key for addressing contemporary challenges that need the most transversal and multidisciplinary responses. In consequences, our campaign, our collecting campaign, Culture 2030 goal, not only calls for the full inclusion of culture in the drafting of, of public policies along the sustainable development goal, but goals, but we also claim that culture has to be the fourth pillar, the 
a vector, a fundamental vector for sustainable development that takes in account the independent interdependence of all of us. So thank you very much for listening and uh, we count on your cooperation. Thanks. Gracias, Tere. Thanks. Uh, really worrying what you said about that. The, these pandemics have shown that the lack of awareness of which, what culture is on behalf of, in relation to our politicians and many, many leaders. And what you said as well, calling for placing culture uh, at the center of all policy debates. Um, it's, I, I think it's for some, some, something critical. In fact, we're moving more about these holistic approaches to policy making and not working in silos. Uh, this is the end of this, this, this strand of the session today. I really, really like to, to thank all of you, the six of you. On the one hand, because you have, I think it's the first panel I moderate that everybody stuck to their time, to the five minutes. So thank you, thank you very much. You have made my life very easy. I think there are lots of ideas, lots of proposals. I'm really, really happy that there is, even you have highlighted all of you, many critical points that there is lots, lots of energy. And this is, I think, very, very important. Now we have invited two persons to react, to make some comments, and uh, which are on the one hand, um, Enrique Avogrado, he's the Minister for Culture of Buenos Aires, a joint member of UCLG and, and Metropolis, and Karima Benune, UN Special Reporter in the field of cultural rights. I'll pass over first to Enrique Avogrado, cuando quieras, Enrique. Ahí estamos. Hola Octavi, ¿qué tal? Hola Emilia, un gusto. Hola Jordi. Abogadro es mi apellido, es medio de un trabalenguas, pero ahí estamos. I will try to do it in English. Uh, greetings to everyone and it's really a pleasure to, to be here with you. It was really, really um, thought provoking what you shared with us and, and I'm, I'm really thankful. Um, I would say that uh, Latin America especially, but probably the rest of the world, uh, it's going through a very dire situation. On the one hand, we actually find out that the our cultural ecosystem is really fragile in terms of um, probably uh, the, the situation that we're going through. And we had an increase in poverty and inequality in our region. And this is still we still don't know what the impact of this COVID-19 will be because we're still going through the, I would say like uh, the water is still up. We have to wait until the, the, the water goes down to understand what, what happened, what really happened. Uh, as many governments in, in all around the world and cities, what we did is we, we, we helped, we, we tried to help especially the independent cultural system of our city uh, but of course, we know that it's not enough. We also went digital as everyone did. And it was really, um, we learned a lot through uh, the digital platform that we launched. First, it was called Cultura en Casa. And, and right now it's called Vivamos Cultura. And we are, we are already thinking about this platform, not as a COVID-19 platform, but something that looks beyond COVID-19, because what we found out is that we can expand in uh, access to culture through this digital means. And, and third, we, we, we try to get back on our feet through dialogue, protocols, and, and still going through this pandemic. What we tried to do is how we can still get people in touch with culture, with cultural venues, with artists, and it was hard, it is still hard. We are facing our second wave is, is coming our way. And, and, and I think that what we learned, and this is why international networks are so useful. And, and I'm, we are especially thankful to UC, to, to UCLG and of course our cultural committee because we, we learned a lot from each other. We actually launched several projects together. We shared best practices and cultural contents, and we were able to go through uh, together. And this, I think it's really important. And I'm sure that we are going to uh, take this uh, experience with us uh, to the post COVID-19 years. Um, ahead, I would say to finish that we have several opportunities. One is to innovate 
probably through frugal innovation. We have, because no one has any money, at least in our region, but still we have our creativity and, but still we have our will to go forward. And uh, there are several uh, regional experiences that are really interesting in terms of how we dealt with uh, getting people in touch with culture. One of them, another opportunity and, and one, of, one way we, we found to innovate is how we reclaimed our cities and the public realm through culture. Uh, it has been, at least in our city, a, a revolution in terms of how we took cultural venues to the streets, to parks and other open air spaces. And I'm sure that these experiences are, are going to, to stay with us after the COVID-19 crisis as restaurants and other venues took over uh, streets, uh, also uh, cultural venues did. And it's really interesting what we learned through this because we, we managed to, to get in touch with new cultural publics uh, out there. And uh, to finish, I would say that the main challenge is to be at the cornerstone of the social reconstruction that lays ahead. Uh, Argentina, it's really in a, a, a very difficult situation in terms of, as, as I said, in, in socioeconomic terms, especially the increase of poverty. And definitely culture has something to say about this. It's uh, vital to expand access to culture as a tool for development. So let me finish with a slight change of what you were saying before. I would say that culture is what we do in order to survive, not after survival, but what we do in order to survive. Thank you very much. And, and it's a pleasure to, to share the floor with you. Muchas gracias. Gracias, Enrique. Y muy interesante lo, lo que describías de Buenos Aires y cómo también, a pesar ¿no? de, de todas las trabas que ha pasado la, la pandemia, esta, esta idea de innovación y cómo también ha ido identificado, ¿no? cómo la cultura ha sido un instrumento para, para reclamar la ciudad y para atraer a nuevas personas ¿no? y, y generar ciudadanía. And now it's, uh, it's over to Karima Benun. As I said before, she is the UN Special Rapporteur in the field of cultural rights. Over to you. Thank you very much. And I thank the organizers for this important digital convening. I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to offer my strong support for your work, recognizing culture as a fourth pillar of development. And I have to say sincerely, I am delighted to have had the chance to listen to your words today uh, during this first panel, which deeply resonated with me. I have tried to carry many of these messages within the UN system, and I have said again and again, culture is the heart of our response to COVID-19. My most recent report for the UN Human Rights Council warns that the pandemic may lead to nothing less than a global cultural catastrophe with severe long lasting consequences for human rights if effective action is not taken immediately to guarantee cultural rights. This will also set back progress toward achieving the SDGs by 2030. I thank you sincerely for your work to tackle all of these challenges. Your collective efforts and leadership are an important source of hope. Culture sectors, as many of you have said this morning for me, this evening for some of you, have been among those hardest hit by COVID-19. Hence, a cultural rights approach to the pandemic is essential. And I have tried to say again and again in the UN system, this is not optional. The cultural rights commitments of states under international law actually require them to take action so as to avoid a cultural catastrophe, but also to lead to cultural renewal as an essential component of any efforts to build back better. And I think your words this morning, this evening, reinforce all of those messages. Even in these trying times when more than 3 million people have died around the world from the virus, cultural rights are not a luxury. They are key to the overall implementation of universal human rights and a crucial part of the responses to many current challenges from the climate emergency to COVID-19 itself. Moreover, the safeguarding and promotion of culture, as you have said, contributes directly to achieving many of the sustainable development goals, such as safe and sustainable cities, the promotion of gender equality, and peaceful and inclusive societies, just to cite a few examples. 
Faced with the grave difficulties of the pandemic, we must remember, as the Rome Charter says, and as I was pleased to cite in my most recent UN report, culture sometimes is the solution and sometimes can help us to find other solutions. In fact, during the pandemic, culture and cultural rights have been vital as a means of supporting mental health and overcoming isolation and for many other reasons. Many say that without culture, they would not have survived lockdowns. However, unless adequate support is provided to the cultural sectors, it will be impossible to fulfill those vital roles going forward. This is not the time for cuts in culture funding, but for increases. And this is a message I have tried to carry in the UN system as well. And as not every state has adequate resources for what is needed in the crisis, that solidarity must also be extended internationally. In closing, uh, let me simply share that my most recent report, which I will put in the chat when I'm done speaking, lays out a cultural rights-based framework for action under the rubric of cultures with an S. And as I listen to you all today, I am so glad to see so much of this reflected in your work. In the cultures framework for pandemic response, C stands for consultation of all affected stakeholders. U is for the urgency of the response needed. L is for legal obligations. T is for 21st century, reminding us that the choices made now about defending cultural rights will be defining of how these rights are enjoyed for years to come. The second U is for upping the funding for culture. R is for rights-based approaches. E stands for everyone, reminding us to maintain focus on inclusion and combat discrimination in the enjoyment of cultural rights. And finally, S represents solidarity, a core human rights value we need to guarantee cultural rights now. So let us continue to work together, guided by these principles, so as to achieve human rights and sustainable development undeterred by COVID-19. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for your words. As you said, cultural rights are not a luxury. I have the feeling we have with you, we have an ally in our side. So now it's, uh, I think it's over to, to Jordi Pascual, coordinator of UCLG Culture Commission. Thank you very much, dear Octavi, for this very good coordination, very good facilitation of the, of the session. Thank you very much to all panelists. Uh, great, great, great speeches. Thank you very much. Uh, one of the most important achievements in, in, in 2020 by UCLG is, is the Rome Charter, a very original document on the right to participate fully and freely in cultural life. It was presented in Rome at a hybrid conference in October and officially approved in our World Council in November. It is one of our main contributions for the pact for the future. Now I invite you to watch the video that explains the charter. What is culture for? Have you ever thought about that? It's everything we do beyond mere survival. It gives meaning to our perceptions. It brings humanity together through emotions, imagination, thoughts. A group of over 20 cities has started an online initiative to advance the right to take part in cultural life as an essential condition for a better society. We're launching a global proposal to promote everyone's right to discover Enjoy, create, share, protect, and participate in culture. It lies at the root of all our connections and in our common future on this planet. Sharing a rich cultural life together empowers us to face challenges and crises and is vital for the rebirth of our cities and communities.
Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure you enjoyed the, the video. The charter is clear. The place of culture in development needs to be upgraded and actors promoting the cultural narrative should sit at the main table of the future of humanity. All panelists in the uh, first round highlighted this fact. Rome is working towards this direction and the organization that hosted the hybrid conference in October, the Pala Expo, is working with several actors promoting projects that relate culture and the arts with the sustainable development goals. I invite Cesare Pietro Justi, the president of Pala Expo, to take the floor and facilitate the next session. Cesare, you have the floor. Thank you, Jordi. Thank you to UCLG and thank you to you all for being here at, at uh, this uh, crucially important appointment. Carta di Roma, the Rome Charter, is a document that fixes the idea that the active participation to cultural life is a fundamental right of, uh, for, for, for an element of justice. And uh, uh, this participation, the active participation to cultural life, means a development of critical thought, means, in, uh, to use Jacques Rancière's words, le partage du sensible, the, 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 the sharing, the sensibility, the sensitivity, all the meanings that have to do with the word the sense, uh, also sensuality, if you want. And, uh, and, uh, and this is an, is an approach that allows us to give a, um, to give a, a, a new meaning uh, of, for our social actions, for our life itself. I think there is no possibility of, uh, um, uh, of, of development of sustainable goals without the sostegno, how we say in Italian, lo sviluppo sostenibile, we need the sostegno, the support, support. of culture. And the, without that, uh, we, we cannot uh, develop critical thought and sensibility and critical thought and sensibility will be the fundamental key to 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 have the sdg possible um artistic research in particular i think has the gives the opportunity offers the opportunity uh, not only to offer beauty but also to offer the possibility of looking at things from different point of views to look at things from the point of view of the other not only offers the possibility to give a meaning, give a special meaning in, uh, in, 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 in positive and in constructive term, even to difficulty, even to pain. Artistic research offers the fundamental possibility of give critical meaning and a special new awareness to our common acts, to our normal acts of, uh, of uh, daily life. And, and Pala Expo, uh, that is a, a, an institution in Rome that depends from Roma Capitale, from uh, the, the administration of the city, and uh, that runs different uh, cultural spaces for exhibitions, for research, for production, for performing arts, for visual arts, for relations between arts and science and other disciplines. Pala Expo has the uh, honor and uh, also the, the responsibility for uh, um, develop the, the, the diffusion, the, the knowledge and the use of uh, the Rome Charter and, uh, and to connect more and more uh, the, the, the idea of culture as a fundamental support for the SDGs. Um, uh, we also are promoting, supporting, uh, new uh, artistic projects that can uh, uh, work as a pilot experience, as, as new experience that can be shared, that can be also um, used in different contexts and uh, uh, shared with different cities, with different realities. And uh, the first of this project that we specifically support at this uh, uh, regard is Orchestral Transformation, uh, a series of uh, projects, in fact, 
for which I leave the word to Valerio Del Baglivo and Sara Alberani, who are two of the four curators who are present here to present orchestras of transformation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cesare Pietro Justi, for this introduction, and thank you, UCLG, for the invitation. Uh, so, as Cesare has mentioned, we are presenting the orchestras of transformation, uh, the project initiated on the launch of the 2020 Rome Charter. I'm Sara Alberani, here from Rome. I'm part of the curatorial team together with Valerio del Baglivo and uh, Matteo Lucchetti and Judith Bilander. And uh, uh, Valerio will mention better the three uh, international artists present, cooking section today with a focus on their work, Jasmine Patija, Marinella Senatore and Joanna Fricot. And uh, this project uh, is aimed to rethink artistic method of intervention in the public sphere. So implementing social change and promoting alternative imaginaries. So as curators, all of us, we are working on the field of socially engaged art practices. We are questioning at the time of the pandemic, what does public sphere mean today? And how to keep acting, how to be stronger, to create support structures on today's urgent issues, thanks to those artistic projects that act with communities, in ecosystems, in territories, and in cities, of course. So we are proposing a city curating method, starting here from Rome, for the achievement of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, and that introduces alternatives together with artists who are themselves policymakers, absolutely, who are acting long-term in the territories, creating mythos and creating, of course, the visions for the today's crisis. So the orchestras of transformation in dialogue with them is proposing a program of translocal solidarity actions, both digitally and physically for this summer and autumn, starting here from Rome. Uh, that includes collaboration with local and international actors, building communities mm -hmm. through social media campaigns, podcasts, artistic actions, with a powerful mediatic impact and aim at a wider audience, in particular, the UCL, UCLG network. So, um, Thank you. I pass the floor to Valerio. Thank you very much to everybody. Uh, we decided to leave most of our time to cooking section we are, uh, who are with us today. But very briefly, I will introduce also the other projects that are part of the Orchestra of, of Transformation. Uh, starting from ongoing research and project, each of the three artists uh, Jasmine Pateia, Marinella Senatore, and Cooking Section sh has chosen to address a different sustainable development goal, working towards the implementation of new form of awareness. Uh, it's important to say that all the practices of the embodied artists focus on the development of socially engaged action by pursuing two goals. One is definitely bringing to public attention issues related to some of the most important contemporary urgencies such as, for example, social inclusion, climate crisis, gender-based violence. Uh, but on the other side, as Sara was mentioning before, they promote alternative imaginaries that implement paths of change, meaning that they collaborate in shaping policy makers' strategies and plans. For example, Jasmine Pateya, who decided to address SDG 5, gender equality, initiated Almost 20 years ago, a project called Blank Noise, which is a growing community of citizens and people committed to ending sexual and gender-based violence in India and beyond. During 20 years, she has designed a wide range of public intervention, using different forms of media to raise public awareness and build form of civil responsibility on the problem. I just wanted to highlight that uh, Along this process, she even worked politically with victims' association to formulate 
stricter laws against gender harassment. For the orchestra, uh, she will work in collaboration with feminists and LGBTQI association in Rome to develop a, a podcast campaign that reflect on the theme of gender-based violence and the language associated with it. Through a participatory artistic practice, artist Marinella Senatore questioned the biopolitics of different community and contribute to a more democratic and collective understanding of creativity. In Rome, she decided to address SDG number 10, reducing inequalities. And in collaboration with Italian, Haitian, Ghanaian curator, and I would say also cultural agitator, Joanna Africot, she will intervene in the public space of the city with an empty monument dedicated to Afro-descendant Italian communities and more in general, our contemporary globalized society with the aim of celebrative and inclusive vision of citizenship. This anti-monument will purposely travel in the city uh, and be placed in front of architects of power and places connotated um, of power, well, like connotated places of powers of Italian history. And last but not least, and then I will really pass the microphone to Alan and Daniel, a British uh, do a cooking section that in 2015 started their site-specific project Climavor, which asks how do we eat as humans, as humans change climate? Through Climavor, they initiated a long-term initiative, including a variety of site-specific interaction uh, and to imagine possible answer to this very important question. For the orchestra, they work on three different SDG, the number two, achieving food security and better nutrition. Number 13, acting for the climate. And number 14, life underwater. And they will conduct a social media campaign to raise awareness of the negative impact of the global maritime ecosystem of salmon farming, which is one of the world's, if not the world's fastest growing food production sector. I wanted to conclude by saying that this artist are really uh, inventing new methodology which have a great impact on the way we can rethink cultural inclusion as a political engine, as a political locomotive, I would say, of social transformation. And uh, with this, I give the floor to Daniel and Alan. Thank you. Thank you very much and very pleased to meet everyone. And thank you for the Rome Charter, Palais Expo, and UCLG for the invitation to be here today. Um, if we could please just ask our slides to be shared with everyone. So we started our project Climavor back in 2015 as a way to think about how we eat as humans change climate. And in the past years, basically, what we have grown to see is how the importance of addressing the climate emergency through culture and through cultural institutions. So over the past years, um, it's through various site-specific projects that we have been working on in various, um, in various locations that we would speak briefly about today we're looking at how the role of cities and the role of cultural institutions within cities can help shape our response and adaptation to the climate crisis. So we developed a climate for website and platform to, to think of how to metabolize climate breakdown, but also to look at the new seasons that are emerging. Like um, if you go to the supermarket, you don't find spring, summer or autumn anymore. You have pretty much all products all year round in cities. So we are looking into what are the new seasons that are emerging. And here we will be presenting three cases, like a, a season of desertification, a season of drought, and a season of um, fish farm pollution. Next, please. <clears throat> so in Sharjah in the United Arab Emirates, the kind of conflict and the difference between the desert and kind of the urbanization of the city has been very prevalent throughout the 20th 20th and the early 21st century. The kind of desire for green spaces in many ways had turned Sharjah 
um, and many cities in the Gulf region with the back to their deserts. Um, our project basically tried to think about the different initiatives and different plants that have been grown with the desert and how could we shape our cities today through um, for watering without water. So in this project, basically, we created a city garden that used desert plants in order to kind of reduce the reliance on the aquifer that is dwindling and kind of try to think of how do we reimagine public space in the city in a desert condition. Next, please. Um, in a period of drought, for instance, we're thinking of how to shift the food culture in the city to other kind of drought resistant crops. In this case, in, in Palermo, in Sicily, we're looking at existing microclimatic structures. Next, please. Uh, where you have all these typologies of how to reduce water stress from, um, sorry, there, um, water stress from trees, um, in this case, citrus, and how to collaborate with restaurants and, and all kinds of actors in the city to promote a new culture that does not rely on irrigation, right? So how to create these new cultures of food consumption that address the climate emergency. Um, and in the case of the Isle of Skye, where we have been working for the past five years, we have been looking at the effects of intensive aquaculture of salmon farms and how they have been eroding the um, existence of wild salmon and also contaminating the shores and the seabed of the Isle of Skye and the northwest coast of Scotland. Next, please. So when we first visited um, the Isle of Skye for the first time, we came across um, this bird, um, which we heard about many stories, a bird that had turned salmon. We were quite uh, fascinated by this image and yet later kind of learned that today all the salmon that we eat um, would actually be gray. But through this samophan, um, a tool that was invented back in the 1980s, today farms can give our salmon the ideal salmon tone. And that house sparrow that we saw earlier in the picture basically ate some feed pellets from a salmon farm. And like a flamingo eating shrimps, it also had turned salmon. Well, sorry time. guys, I, I have to ask you to end in a couple of minutes because we are a little bit late. The organization okay. tell us. Thank you, sorry. Okay. Um, so what we so next um, next what we have been looking at is into these kind of dis disrupted ecologies and how fish farms not only in Scotland but also in the Mediterranean and many other places are completely disrupting the ecology and started to think next how we could think of alternative uh, food cultures that go beyond fish farms that are completely destroying the water ecology. Next, um, next, next. Uh, so what we started doing is a public platform that looks like an oyster table in the intertidal zone as a public um, art intervention that, that also uh, served as a site for performances to rethink those um, futures for food. Uh, next, we um, this is how it looks at high tide. The, the oyster table has oysters, mussels, seaweeds, next, which clean the water by breathing and can bring a new kind of form of eating um, uh, and, and dealing with ecology. Next. Um, in this process, Next. we have also worked with different schools, different organizations, basically, to rediscover the coastal heritage of places like Sky and the west coast of Scotland through programs of apprenticeships. And recently, if we move forward, we just opened an exhibition at Tate Britain, where we collaborated with the four restaurants throughout the four Tates across the country to remove salmon off their menu and introduce a climb of our dish instead. So by bringing together cultural institutions, food establishments, we can really think how our cities today can take responsibility in shaping the future of generations to come in the face of the climate emergency. And for our project, we really question what is the role of the city or how a city can become climb of our, how can it eat according to the climate emergency in order to ensure that we have a livable and inhabitable planet in the future. So the premise for Climavor is to think of these 
futures that deal with kind of alternative aquacultures, regenerative food systems, and how to include um, the cultural heritage of food production to tackle the climate emergency by um, changing those kind of cultures and cultivating habitats instead. Thank you very much. It was really interesting. And uh, I'm sorry to have asked you to be as short as possible that the organization uh, is inflexible on timing with us. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Daniel and Alon. Thanks a lot. I think that uh, your example, um, your presentation is must, can be of great interest for many of the people who have who are participating to this to this meeting. I give the word to Jordi back. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Cesare. Thank you very much to 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 all the curators and uh, all the artists of uh, the orchestras of transformation. Let me invite all cities and partners to, to be in touch with the work of the, of, of the orchestras. We will uh, certainly disseminate your work uh, in the next weeks and, and, and months. Um, the, the Rome Charter is uh, written, has been written by many hands, uh, it, but it exists uh, uh, also because of the leadership of one man, Luca Bergamo, who uh, was the uh, deputy mayor of uh, culture in Rome in 2020 and, and the years uh, before. Uh, the Rome Charter is fully coherent with the policies undertaken by the cities of the UCLG Culture Committee in the past and in the present. The next session will focus on some of these cities. And I invite Jean-Pierre Longembassy, the Secretary General of UCLG Africa, and also one of the champions in our organization on the advocacy for culture in development to facilitate this uh, session, final session. Jean-Pierre, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jordi. Hi, everybody. I'm happy that you are around because unfortunately, we, we lost some of our friends due to this uh, terrible pandemic. And uh, I am happy that many of you are still here and uh, I hope we'll enjoy a, a, a hand, a shake hand uh, in, in the coming, coming future. Well, uh, the room charter uh, is a, a serious headway in, in, in the right direction. And I think we, we all agree that um, local and regional government has made uh, serious progress on the front of uh, defending culture as the fourth pillar of the sustainable development. Uh, let me, before we go into uh, calling uh, the, uh, the presenter, let me read a passage of the preamble of the Rome Charter, uh, because we have to remember exactly what we, we, we sign up to. I quote, culture is the expression of values, a common renewable resource in which we meet one another, learn what can unite us and how to engage with differences in a shared space. Culture is a creative workshop with which citizens can imagine responses to our common challenges. End of quote. I think many people uh, highlighted that culture has been in crisis uh, due to COVID. But you should also recognize that at the same time, people have been very thirsty of culture. And that was materialized by many ways of communicating through culture during COVID. Remember the applause, remember all the songs that were released during this period. Remember what the cultural communities have proposed. So people know for sure that culture is one response maybe 
the most important response to any crisis. And culture is what unites us. Now, I think it is important to highlight that the Rome Charter on Cultural Rights provides cities and territories with an alphabet that contains five verbs. Discover, cultural rules, shaping identity heritage of the city, create cultural expression, ensuring to enrich the life of the city beyond its physical survival, share cultural creativity to connect social experience and improve on our humanity, enjoy cultural resources and spaces to open up the minds to cultural diversity and find inspiration from culture, protect all forms of cultural expression and participate in cultural resources in order to elevate ourselves to respect equal dignity of human beings. So I think it is through this alphabet that the Rome, uh, the Rome Charter uh, gave us a sense of what we should be doing in terms of uh, giving our places and identity and authenticity a sense of curiosity and surprise. And I think uh, we need to see with the experience of the, the, the cities that were invited to participate in this uh, uh, panel, how do they translate this alphabet into their own places? And how do they see their city contributing to the Rome Charter in the in the and in the UCLG Pact for the future. Uh, let me ask Madame Catarina Van Pinto, Councillor for Culture in the City of Lisbon, to bring uh, experience first. Madame Catarina. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, dear Jean Pierre Mabar, dear colleagues from Thank you very much for the invitation, it, and it's a pleasure to be with you here. So, um, since we joined uh, the, the Culture Committee of UCLG in 2014, and, uh, and since then we've tried to put into practice all the most significant do uh, policy documents that uh, the committee released, mainly the Agenda 2021 for Culture, the um, Culture 21 Actions, uh, and now more, more recently, uh, the Rome Charter. We have been pilot city uh, from 2015 to, to until 2017, and since 2019, also living city. Uh, and so we are very much involved in all these um, uh, policy ideas. And we think the Rome Charter, with its focus on rights and the, the cultural the rights to participate fully in cultural life and cultural um, participation. It's really a major document and it's also a major cont contribution in policy terms to in reality what we try to achieve here in the city since we took charge of the, the cultural department already in 2009. And one of the main goals that we always in UCL, uh, the claim was, uh, in a very, uh, our light motive was to bring co culture closer to people and vice versa, people, to bring people closer to culture in order to, uh, to combine the attraction for culture with the need for culture. So our main goal has been always to enlarge and broaden pu uh, public participation in culture and grow charter, com it's completely, uh, the goal, what I, what I interpret is the goal of the Rome Charter, and it's very much needed in our present times. So I can give you three main examples how we, we, we try to put this into practice, mainly to our libraries network, 
we we developed a lot we transformed we, we renovated our li library networks our libraries not only with the physical renovation but also to create a new mission for our libraries so they can uh, be seen as a kind of cultural proximity center not only for lending books and reading books but uh, to promote all uh, the the cultural activities uh, neighborhood cultural activities and in that uh, re related to that to the, the our uh, library of merville it's our flagship project it's a library that we opened in 2016 in a, a social neighborhood and it had the capacity since then to completely transform this area where there were no not a civic center not even a square to be a gathering uh, uh, place and so the library acts as this uh, community and gathering place that the urban in, the urban pl planning didn't achieve so uh, and it's it has been very important to bring uh, to to bring, to create access to culture because it's a, a an area where most of the people had no experience at all of having a go attend public performance, going to libraries, read books. And since then, it has been a big change in this. Area. So what we are doing is that uh, we, we, we made a big effort to, to, to consider the public, the outdoors uh, space, as a, main stage, uh, as a main stage for artistic activities. So is it uh, broaden it's also a way of broadening access to culture and also eliminate barriers mainly most of these activities ha uh, have no are free activities and it, there is a very close relation with arts mainly uh, bringing performance in squares um, gardens uh, all over the cities um, uh, very strong uh, program on street art. So the city is considered now one of the most important cities, uh, worldwide cities on street art. And this is very important to have uh, uh, artistic uh, uh, murals all over the city. It's not only the center. So this idea of only not only having um, culture in the traditional places and the conventional places, but uh, uh, disseminating it all over the city, and uh, on the other, and the third example would be a very strong uh, educational project that we uh, launched. It's called Scholar, and it's we we it's an annual program in which all our major uh, equipments, uh, being be it uh, uh, monuments, museums, or theaters. They have special programs that relate to the, the curricula of the schools, the, the, the public schools and the, the curricula defined by the Ministry of Education. So we try to teach uh, uh, school curricula through artistic practice. And this is also a way, a very important way we think education is the main, um, we, we cannot change uh, people perception about culture if we don't act right since the beginning when people since uh, people uh, with the children and young people and um, uh, students so it's also a very important project that we have been we put in practice in recent years um now concerning the covid uh, so covid and the um, the COVID crisis and to over, over, overcome the COVID crisis is also a, a way of putting the Rome Charter into, into practice because uh, I think all the cities and we all uh, understood that uh, I think there is a, a new conscience about the value of people, of culture in everyday life. And so all over the world, it's what I, I understand for sharing the experience with all my colleagues and other cities. Uh, and I think so. In, in, in relating to that, we tried to uh, to maintain as as much as we could the the level of activity, uh, cultural activity in the cities, maintaining our the contracts, maintaining our fully maintaining our support, even broadening our um, our scope of interventions because uh, we started to fund it, fund also. Uh, commercial cultural uh, projects, which not use not 
were not uh, our uh, target until now. So we we funded uh, Hafado's houses. Uh, we funded uh, grass mu grass music venues, grass music venues. We, found, we funded libraries, private theaters, bookshops, and so in order to keep the commercial sector of the cultural uh, of the cu the cultural cultural sector, commercial cultural sector also alive. Um, and so, uh, and it's important for the the vitality of the whole ecosystem. So uh, we hope that uh, uh, we keep can for sure it will remain a major uh, a major goal of our policy city policy. Not only not thinking only in uh, as a uh, 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 sectorial policy. Uh, in the city, but as an overall project, a multi-dimensional uh, policy that will be present in the next future. Because I think uh, culture in uh, its uh, 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 capacity to build bridges across other sectors, across uh, people, will have a major role in the period that will start is starting already. That is the recovery and the reopening of all the city life. Uh, so today, last uh, yesterday, the, our theaters uh, reopen. Uh, next month, we will have more open air uh, festivals and things. So we are slowly going out, and we hope culture will play a major role in this new period. Thank you. Thank you, Catalina. Thank you very much. Uh, I gather from your presentation uh, two words: bring culture closer to people bring people closer to culture. This is a program. And uh, it is demonstrated with very good example. Thank you so much. And now we go to uh, Wabat, Morocco. Uh, Mayor, Mayor Sadiki, what can you tell us about uh, what you are doing on the implementation of the Rome Charter? Merci Jean-Pierre, merci <coughs> Madame la Secrétaire Générale de CG du Monde, honorable maire, vice-maire, élus locaux, représentants des organisations internationales, de la société civile, chers partenaires, honorable assistance. Très heureux de prendre part à cette, à cette table ronde, à ce séminaire, à ce, ce que vous voulez l'appeler en parlant de la charte de Rome, pour dire que nous avons, euh, c'est-à-dire nous avons déjà, nous avons déjà pris part de cette, de cette charte et nous l'appliquons, ça fait déjà un bon moment, mais euh, quand même, le, le, le thème que vous avez choisi aujourd'hui, c'est-à-dire la culture dans le développement durable, l'heure est venue de resserrer les liens, je crois que ce sujet représente une base permettant de consolider le droit des gouvernements locaux et régionaux à la participation dans la vie culturelle de leur territoire et surtout d'assurer la continuité des actions, notamment la campagne culturelle 2030 et la charte de Rome, à laquelle, comme j'ai dit, nous avons pris part déjà. C'est une thématique qui s'aligne parfaitement avec nos orientations, notre vision politique et nos actions en matière de développement culturel. Elle permettra certainement de renforcer le rôle des gouvernements locaux et régionaux dans la promotion de la culture, qui représente incontestablement le quatrième pilier du développement durable, à côté de la croissance économique, l'inclusion sociale et les équilibres environnementaux. Mesdames et messieurs, il est bien connu que la ville de Rabat dispose d'une connotation assez particulière qui a favorisé sa distinction à la chaîne nationale et internationale, avec ses atouts naturels et son patrimoine culturel et urbanistique qui ont guidé à travers le temps son développement urbain vers la diversité culturelle et la durabilité. Rien que le programme de mise à niveau Rabat-Ville-Lumière, capitale culturelle du Maroc, initié par Sa Majesté le Roi en 2014, rien que ce programme qui est mis à niveau tous les espaces, et en particulier les espaces culturels, euh, a rendu un peu, euh, c'est-à-dire notre capitale, qui était déjà historique et impériale, ouverte à l'international, verte aussi, 
par excellence depuis 2010, il lui a rendu un autre éclat qui est culturel. Et nous sommes, d'ailleurs Jean-Pierre va, va, va le témoigner, nous sommes, nous sommes déjà préparés pour, pour célébrer eh, la première capitale africaine de la culture. Nous avons un, un programme très vaste et très chargé, seulement on attend à ce que cette pandémie disparaisse de notre vie ou au moins, moins, moins qu'il soit allégé pour que nous puissions -dire, célébrer cette, 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 -à -dire ce titre attribué à la ville, à la ville de Rabat, parce que pour les efforts qu'il est en train de faire dans cette question de, 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 de la culture. Rabat aussi connaît un grand mouvement de régénération urbaine avec un rayonnement culturel imminent. Plusieurs projets ont été initiés dans le cadre de partenariats bilatéraux et multilatéraux et qui ont façonné sa fibre en lui permettant de jouir d'une empreinte de ville culturelle, inclusive et durable. Rabat abrite également un nombre important de sites patrimoniaux et accueille les rencontres culturelles et artistiques internationales, comme les festivals moisines, rythme du monde, le festival international du cinéma d'auteur, le festival de la Méditerranée des écrits féministes, le festival de Madir, le festival du livre, etc. Et j'en passe. Et on a une, une dizaine encore que je n'ai pas cité et la liste n'est pas exhaustive. Il lui a permis, donc je parle du, du programme de mise à niveau, une nouvelle dynamique territoriale et, de, et qui la hisse parmi les grandes métropoles mondiales en lui offrant un rayonnement national et international, sans précédent avec l'émergence d'une fibre culturelle prononcée et marquée par ses multiples musées, fondation des musées, le musée d'art contemporain, le musée Mohamed VI, le musée archéologique, la Villa des Arts, le théâtre Mohamed V rénové, le grand théâtre de, de Rabat, le théâtre Le Mansour et d'autres salles de culture réparties dans tout le territoire de la ville de Rabat. De par cette vocation prononcée, la capitale Rabat abrite les grandes universités, écoles supérieures du Maroc, l'Université Mohamed V, l'École nationale supérieure de l'administration, l'École d'architecture, l'École Mohamedia des ingénieurs, et j'en passe. Et regroupe tous les départements ministériels, parlement, les représentations diplomatiques. C'est l'occasion de, de, de les remercier parce que toutes les représentations diplomatiques à Rabat ont souhaité et ont exprimé c'est-à-dire leur désir à collaborer avec nous dans le grand programme des festivités pour la, la proclamation de la ville de Rabat en tant que la première capitale culturelle de la, de, de la culture de la, africaine. Donc, je, je suis en train de dire, dans ce contexte, plusieurs actions locales qui s'inscrivent prioritairement dans l'agenda 2030 avec ses 17 objectifs, le nouvel agenda urbain, l'agenda 2063 africain, ont été initiés en partenariat avec ses représentations diplomatiques, comme exemple avec la Corée du Sud, avec la République tchèque, avec la ville de Moscou, le centre culturel français et le centre culturel espagnol des Pays-Bas, etc. Permettant de s'ouvrir sur les cultures autres que les siennes. Le partenariat avec les associations actives dans le territoire a permis de dynamiser les échanges culturels et de contribuer au bien vivre ensemble des communautés, notamment dans le contexte de la crise sanitaire liée à la pandémie du COVID-19, comme par exemple, nous avons l'année dernière, même en période de confinement, nous avons organisé notre festival du printemps de l'Agdal, Rabia Agdal, dans une édition virtuelle, pendant dix jours, on a transmis, on a -dire, fait vivre toute la, 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 la ville de Rabat, tous les citoyens, les citoyens de la ville de Rabat, par ce festival. On est rentré chez eux. Malheureusement, on n'a pas pu nous resserrer et les, les mains, mais quand même, la chaleur de la culture est arrivée à tous les foyers au sein de la ville de Rabat. Pour conclure, en tant que député maire de la ville, je conclue que cette intervention, en saisissant l'occasion de cette plateforme virtuelle pour lancer un plaidoyer qui promue les facteurs culturels, comme j'ai dit au départ, le quatrième pilier du développement durable, totalement euh, indispensable comme les trois autres et avec la même importance. 
Merci pour votre attention. Thank you, Mayor Sadiki, for your words. Time is now to strengthen the ties between our cities through the implementation of the Rome Charter. And you invite to all the cities of the world to come and celebrate Rabat as the first African capital of culture. Thank you for so much. So um, now we cross the Atlantic and uh, go to Mexico City. Madame Vanessa Bujerquez, Secretary of, for Culture. Is she around? Uh, hello, thank you so much uh, uh, for this you. opportunity. Buenos días a todas y todos. Eh, apreciada Emilia, miembros de, GSL, de CGLU y asistentes al evento, eh, al que nos convocan también con Habitat y Metrópolis para reflexionar sobre el papel de la cultura en el desarrollo sostenible. El tiempo es ahora, es la frase que se propone para guiar nuestra reflexión y sentimos un gran entusiasmo por escuchar todo lo que tienen que decir las otras ciudades al respecto. Y es que sostener que el tiempo es ahora, en el marco del Día de la Tierra, este próximo 22 de abril, es un claro llamado de urgencia para que tomemos conciencia de que en efecto no contamos con un planeta B, por si este colapsa, y que es indispensable preocuparnos por cuidar de nuestro entorno a través de un pacto por la humanidad y por un futuro sostenible que realicemos desde los diversos territorios del planeta. Como bien señalaba la vicesecretaria general de la ONU el año pasado, nuestra tierra se encuentra en un punto de inflexión sin precedentes, por lo que tenemos que adoptar tres prioridades con carácter de urgente en todas nuestras políticas públicas. La recuperación de la biodiversidad planetaria, detener el consumismo depredador y afrontar el cambio climático para poder frenarlo con acciones coordinadas. Tenemos la responsabilidad de cuidar de nuestro planeta y en ese sentido la cultura no es una esfera excluyente de la acción a favor del medio ambiente, sino una oportunidad más de transformación. Así lo hemos asumido en CGLU, en nuestro Pacto por el Futuro, en la campaña de Metas 2030 y en la Carta de Roma 2020. Este último ejercicio, la Carta de Roma, fue el resultado de un proceso de reflexión y debate de un grupo de 45 ciudades de todos los continentes, de redes internacionales y expertos durante la primera ola de la contingencia sanitaria de la COVID-19. Se trata de una reflexión global a problemas globales como lo es la relación entre la cultura y un futuro sostenible para la humanidad y nuestro planeta, buscando articular las administraciones nacionales con las locales a fin de garantizar la participación de todas las personas en la vida cultural de sus comunidades, tal y como indica el artículo 27 de la Declaración Universal de los Derechos Humanos, reconociendo el poder de las ciudades para la transformación positiva. Son cinco las capacidades que buscamos fortalecer para alcanzar nuestro objetivo de mejorar el lugar de la cultura en la conversación global sobre el desarrollo y hacer de la cultura una respuesta a los grandes retos que enfrentará el mundo tras la pandemia de COVID-19. Invitar a las ciudades a descubrir sus raíces culturales, su identidad y patrimonio, asumiendo la diversidad intercultural. Apoyarlas para crear expresiones culturales compartir y generar un intercambio cultural permanente para enriquecer la vida cultural de la ciudad, disfrutar de los recursos y espacios culturales de la ciudad para que todas las personas puedan inspirarse, educarse y renovarse. Además, proteger los recursos culturales comunes de la ciudad. En la Ciudad de México, creemos que esta hoja de ruta de la Carta de Roma se articula perfectamente con nuestra política a favor de los derechos culturales de los habitantes y visitantes de la capital del país la cual está consignada en la reciente Constitución Política de la Ciudad de México. Es importante destacar que, al igual que el texto de la Carta de Roma, busca difundir un lenguaje sencillo y directo el debate global sobre la cultura y desarrollo sostenible desde la Secretaría de Cultura de la Ciudad de México, a través del Instituto de la Defensa de los Derechos Culturales, lanzamos la Cartilla de Derechos Culturales. Esta se puede consultar en la página Capital Cultural en Nuestra Casa. Es un texto muy necesario, pues una parte fundamental de la implementación de nuestra política a favor de los derechos culturales pasa por su divulgación. 
un derecho que no es conocido difícilmente puede ser ejercido. Por lo que esta cartilla es una gran aportación al conocimiento, promoción y difusión de estos derechos entre los habitantes y visitantes de la capital. Asimismo, estos derechos vienen acompañados de programas y acciones tales como el apoyo a los creadores culturales comunitarios en medio de la pandemia, el fortalecimiento y ampliación de la red de faros, los puntos de innovación, libertad, arte y saberes, o el impulso de espacios culturales para garantizar el acceso equitativo a la cultura para todas las personas del territorio. Esperamos, esperamos poder desplegar más a fondo en otro espacio toda la constelación de derechos culturales que son reconocidos y forman parte de la política cultural de la Ciudad de México. Por lo pronto, resta decir que consideramos que este evento es una oportunidad más para reforzar nuestra convicción sobre el papel transformador de la cultura en el desarrollo sostenible y trasladar nuestro mensaje a todos los territorios que se articulen en nuestra red, sumando fuerzas en este cambio global al que todas y todos estamos convocados. No, los de, no debemos de olvidar, el tiempo de actuar es en este momento. Si queremos heredar un futuro de bienestar a las nuevas generaciones, que habitarán el planeta Tierra y mantendrán vivo nuestro patrimonio cultural. Nuevamente, muchas gracias a todas y todos por su presencia y, nos tenemos, y no tenemos la menor duda de que el diálogo de esta jornada será muy enriquecedor para todos los asistentes. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Vanessa, for confirming that the, the room charter articulate a roadmap on sustainable cultural development. And you also say that it can be used to promote cultural right and the transformation or the transforming role of cultural development in our cities. Very well articulated. Now the turn to Mr. Gonzalo Olabaria, Secretary for Culture of Bilbao in Spain. Gonzalo. Buenas tardes, compañeros, compañeras de CGLU. Un placer estar con todos vosotras y vosotros. Bueno, en primer lugar, mi agradecimiento tanto a CGLU como a un Habitat y Metrópolis por la organización de esta jornada, que pone el foco, como ha quedado claro, en la necesidad de potenciar la centralidad de la cultura. Y ahora, más que nunca. Efectivamente, ya lo veníamos comentando, 2020-2021 son dos años que van a quedar grabados a fuego en nuestra memoria. Nadie de los que estamos viviendo esta pandemia y probablemente tampoco nadie de las siguientes generaciones vamos a ser capaces de olvidar los sufrimientos que nos ha traído la COVID-19. Entiendo que desde CGLU nuestra obligación debería ser intentar al menos que 2020 y 2021 fueran recordados también como los años en los que dimos el impulso definitivo a la cultura como cuarto pilar del desarrollo. Antes lo estábamos comentando aquí en Bilbao y efectivamente el título de, de la jornada es magnífico. Ahora es el momento. Es el momento de potenciar la cultura como factor de desarrollo sostenible. Desde Bilbao y desde CGLU en su conjunto y en línea con la Agenda 21 reivindicamos firmemente la cultura como un derecho y como un valor en sí mismo. Durante muchos años hemos buscado, hemos intentado hallar el valor instrumental de la cultura, pero la cultura creemos y alineados con la Carta de Roma que es, la cultura es un valor en sí mismo. Estamos convencidos de que necesitamos la cultura para vivir plenamente y que desde la cultura y la cultura nos hace mejores como personas y como sociedades. Por tanto, un primer mensaje que efectivamente estas jornadas son, esta jornada es muy acertada y que tenemos que seguir trabajando mucho para que el futuro sea mejor. También sabemos que promover la participación de toda la ciudadanía sin exclusiones en la vida cultural de la comunidad ya era un objetivo importante, muy importante, antes de la pandemia. Sin embargo, la pandemia lo ha hecho mucho más palpable, lo ha hecho mucho más evidente. Ahora estamos inmersos en múltiples desafíos, desafíos que han venido acrecentados por estos tiempos inciertos. Son muchas las incógnitas que tenemos, creo todos nosotros y nosotras, sobre qué nos deparará esta nueva sociedad post-pandemia. Pero... Sin duda alguna contamos con una certeza. Sin una decidida apuesta por la cultura, como ya han dicho anteriormente mis compañeros y compañeras, no será posible hacer frente a los retos que tenemos por delante. 
Y también otra reflexión que creemos importante, que las ciudades jugamos un papel clave en hacer efectivo este derecho a la participación cultural. Por tanto, y ya lo estamos intentando hacer desde Bilbao, tenemos que redoblar nuestros esfuerzos para pasar de las palabras a los hechos, disponiendo de las políticas, y no nos olvidemos también, de los recursos necesarios para que la cultura ocupe un rol de centralidad. Centralidad no en el momento de los grandes eventos, no en fechas señaladas, sino centralidad en el día a día de todas nuestras ciudades. Y en este camino hacia la centralidad de la cultura creemos que hay diversas herramientas que nos han venido resultando de utilidad y a las cuales se ha añadido una muy importante, cuál es la Carta de Roma. Esta declaración creemos que supone un antes y un después para fomentar la participación y para afianzar nuestro compromiso, el compromiso de los gobiernos locales con unas políticas culturales que apuesten por la diversidad y por la defensa de unos valores democráticos. Como ya adelantaba, la carta llega en el momento oportuno, en tiempos inciertos, en los que fácilmente se podría caer en la tentación de olvidarse de la cultura. La declaración de la Carta de Roma es o son o constituyen una serie de principios, pero también es clara y rotunda y nos debe de servir de guía para poder afrontar los retos que nos esperan. Nuestro compromiso, el compromiso de la ciudad de Bilbao, es que vamos a poner todo nuestro empeño en llevar a la práctica esta carta. Una carta que, insisto, compartimos plenamente y que coincide en nuestra reivindicación de la cultura como un derecho y como un valor en sí mismo. Nadie creemos ni decimos que el futuro vaya a ser fácil, pero no cabe duda que la mejor manera de avanzar es hacerlo juntos. La colaboración entre ciudades es la única vía de salir adelante. En buena medida y con todas nuestras diferencias, que entendemos que son diferencias que también nos enriquecen, las ciudades que integramos CGLU compartimos muchos problemas. Trabajemos juntos para compartir también las soluciones. Y a este respecto, la cuarta cumbre de la cultura que se va a celebrar próximamente en Izmir, ya cuyo alcalde Tung, saludo desde aquí, nos va a brindar una ocasión inmejorable para el enriquecimiento mutuo. Por tanto, muchas gracias. Felicidades a los organizadores por esta oportunidad. Es que ricasco. Thank you, thank you so much for keeping the time and being so direct. Uh, time is now to recognize culture as the fourth pillar of sustainable development. The chart of Rome came at the right time and what i gather from all that we exchange here are, are three words participation of all citizens in culture partnership with all the sectors including the professionals of culture and creative sector and solidarity through sharing our problem sharing our solution for a better life Thank you. The floor is to Jolly, if I may. Thank you, Jean-Pierre. Um, apologies for, for not having been able to extend the time. Uh, this is a struggle and, 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 and we, we, will have, we would have loved to hear uh, much more from, from you all, uh, but we have to to stick to the to the limitations of, of time. Uh, Emilia, the floor is yours for the final remarks and for the final goodbye, uh, for the perhaps see you soon better, Emilia. Yeah, it is more kind of uh, see you soon indeed, continue to work with us and we have a lot of homework to do. I think uh, today uh, we have explored angles um, that brought us even closer together, the, um, the urgency of, of action and, and the importance of putting this up front in our agendas is, is very critical. I think it is critical for the pact of the future. It is critical for us if we want to go from a, um, uh, from, from, um, from a society that is providing services to a society that is caring uh, and needs to be innovative and transformative. So we really hope that some of the, these inputs will, will reach uh, concrete proposals that we are bringing to, to uh, the deliberations of our executive bureau. Um, I think it shows also a lot of community 
and capacity to act together, as some of the partners were saying. Thank you very much for your attention. Please do join us in this road uh, towards uh, transformation. Congratulations, uh, Secretariat team, for pulling this together. And thank you, everybody. Nothing else to say. Please keep healthy, keep creating, and keep calm and positive. See you soon again. Our next, our next one, our next cities are listening is going to be around food systems. So we look forward to you joining some of that following today's discussion. Bye bye. Thank you, Jordi. Thank you, Marta. Thank you, Sara. Bye.